50% value attributed to the IP of Gillette. Now the interesting part is that when we looked at the balance sheet of Gillette, there was no IP recognized in their balance sheet. And it is because of this accounting regulation only. But when the combined entity, including PNG and Gillette, then the IP of $24 million was recognized. And the reason is that there are different rules when you acquire a brand from a company and then the counting standards allow you to recognize the same as a set in their balance sheet. So this is how the, uh, you know, somewhat inconsistency in the accounting regulations are. And uh, another important aspect is whenever you recognize IP, like goodwill or distribution rights, etc., you are not allowed to upgrade their value in the books of accounts. So it can only go down. Now in case of Gillette, in the subsequent years, its market value actually rose by 5% or so. But accounting regulations do not allow you to do that, and they only talk about impairment rules and amortization rules. Meaning thereby you have to test them for impairment as to whether their market worth remains the same as were originally assessed, and if there is any shortfall in their valuation, then you have to uh, you know, write it off to profit and loss account. So moving quickly, this is a very uh, you know, fantastic example of how the difference in market valuation and book valuation can defy all logics. Acquisition of WhatsApp by Facebook in 2013. You know, WhatsApp is a company with tangible assets of $178 million, losses of $140 million in, in that year, with nil intangible assets in their balance sheet. And it was acquired by Facebook for about $19 billion. And the basis of valuation was that because of the unique attribute of IP that uh, WhatsApp has, and the revenue model, the future revenue model, because WhatsApp is now free, but Facebook has a plan of charging uh, 99 cents per user in, you know, from second year onwards, and that's how you know, they, they put this kind of valuation. So financial reporting based on historical costing is not reflecting of market value, but there are interesting perspective, and these are some of the disclosures that some of the other companies have shown. You know, securitization of IP and Kingfisher Airlines is a very good example here. You know, Kingfisher Airlines issued you know, approached bankers, State Bank of India, and they got a loan of 2,500 crore rupees by placing their brand, Kingfisher Airlines, as a collateral security for raising that loan. And this is, so this is very interesting, and uh, you know, later on it, was, it got classified as NPA of banker, that's a different matter though. And similarly, you know, there are other instances like United Spirits, like LT Foods, where their brands was accept, accepted by bankers as a security, as a collateral, you know, for financing the uh, business needs of these companies. So clearly, you know, if we look at the balance sheet of the Indian companies, then this is another interesting disclosure that, uh, that comes to our attention. But key factors considered by bankers here as, uh, you know, the predictable cash flows, the valuation risk, and the exit strategy for IP uh, in that sense. Now moving on, Tax regulations in India. So this is a broad snapshot of tax regulations in India. If a company sets up, and there are a lot of companies which have set up R&D facilities, in-house R&D facilities in India. Most of them belong to pharma sector, and where uh, you know, so if you carry out any R&D ex expenditure, then you are allowed 200% weighted tax deduction, and that's a very significant one, which provides significant tax relief to these companies. But no tax incentive is available to the captive R&D centers of foreign companies. So if Microsoft or Philips have their R&D centers in India, they are not entitled to it because the IP arising out of that development efforts resides in the foreign company. 25% tax depreciation on intangible assets on all IPs. And of course, you know, when you transfer IP, then whatever value is generated that is subjected to capital gains, subjected to withholding taxes, TDS. And of course, there are certain other rules which uh, you know, we'll talk about. Uh, so this is the tax authority's perspective. Here is a case, and although you know it's a case of the US tax authorities, but the same principle would hold good even for India as well. A company transferred its IP at $118 million valuation, and the tax authorities said 
that this valuation is not correct, it's $2.5 billion. So this can be the magnitude uh, of the uh, you know, the valuation dispute that one can have from tax authorities' perspective. Because you know, the more the valuation, the more the tax collections to the tax authorities. Now moving on, this slide talks about the main tax controversies uh, on intangible assets or IPs in India today. And I've talked about three cases. One is all these foreign companies having R&D centers in India. The Indian tax authorities believe that because of the significant R&D efforts that are being carried on here, it gives rise to IP in India, not outside India. Because the way you recognize IP is a kind of a contractual obligation which can be manipulated and you know that way IP can be shifted to outside India. So tax authorities have uh, you know, raised huge tax demands running into millions of dollars on various foreign companies and you know which came into limelight and a uh, lot of uh, a lot of UN cry was raised on that and uh, the finance ministry had to clarify something and uh, you know this, so this is one controversy that's being faced by uh, many of the companies the other controversy is uh, you know this is a very recent news uh, flipkart all these online companies you know they give deep discounts to the customers to build their brand loyalty and that's where very recently tax authorities have said that this kind of strategy of deep discounting is giving rise to IP in India and accordingly, you know, I mean, this is to be, uh, this is to be recognized as IP even though you are trying to charge off these expenses as operating expenditure in your books of accounts and trying to not show that IP in their books. So this is a kind of a diverse approach uh, that tax authorities have taken. And the other one is marketing intangible. This is very interesting and, and all the MNCs in India today are facing this issue. So all the companies like Canon, Sony, Ericsson, you know, all these companies have, you know, entities in India which carry out distributor, which act as a distributor for uh, selling goods in India. And tax authorities believe that because IP is owned legally by the foreign parents, so accordingly, whatever advertisement expenses, etc., are incurred in the Indian Indian territory, these result in creating marketing intangibles for the for these entities and accordingly, you know, they've raised huge transfer pricing adjustments running into uh, 25,000 crore rupees or so. So this is, uh, the, you know, the magnitude of uh, this. Now, to sum up, there are low level of intangible asset disclosures in the balance sheets of Indian companies. And this is because uh, of peculiar accounting regulations in India that we have. And there is a distinction between self-generated versus acquired. So therefore, if we are looking at the balance sheet of companies, you know, you may find IP recognition in some cases, but not in other cases. And that may be because of the difference between self-generated and acquired. And IP valuation is a subjective and complex exercise and securitization of IP. You know, wherever bankers have given finances is limited to licenses, patents, and brands in few cases. And of course, tax aspects uh, need to be handled very carefully. With this, my time is over, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you.